Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 3.41, An Empire Stretched Thin. Welcome back. This week, we are going to bring to a close our series on the French and Indian War, our Season 3 narrative, as well as the story of the North American British colonies as a whole. Next season, we are, of course, still going to be dealing with the colonies. However, as we are going to see, we are entering into a new era of the colonial experience in North America. Just a decade and a half in the future, the North American colonies are going to declare their independence. Next season, this podcast will begin the march towards the American Revolution, and by the time we wrap up Season 4, we will officially be dealing with a country called the United States. Before we plunge in for today, however, I do have just a few programming notes. As I have said before, after today we are going to have two review episodes, followed by a third retrospective episode looking at everything we have talked about thus far. This should officially tie a bow on the colonial era and help us pull together the strings to understand just what this entire thing has meant. We will then wrap up Season 3 with the question and answer episode, so if you have questions you need to go ahead and get those to me. You can send them my way via either email or Twitter, and I'll go ahead and include that information in the show notes for today. The deadline for questions is going to be the day the second part of our season in review comes out. So you have four weeks from today to get those questions in. Okay, with that, on to the show. Last time, we left off with the final surrender of Canada. The French had been defeated in North America. However, just because the North American Front was now done, it does not mean that the Greater War itself was over. On the contrary, the war would continue in both Europe and indeed around the globe for several more years. My goal today is to give you all a quick summary of the events of the Seven Years' War and discuss specifically the position that the great European powers were in following the end of that war. Because critically, well, individual battles will not be terribly important for the North American colonies. It is necessary to understand where everybody is at the end of the war to fully grasp the relationship between the British and their North American colonies heading into the 1760s and 70s. By the time that we head into 1760, the war in Europe was drifting towards becoming a war of attrition. By this point, all the major European powers, except for Spain, were involved in the war. Really, though, on the continent, little was happening. There were battles, of course, but largely, the war had fallen into a stalemate. The French held a numerical advantage over the combined British and Prussian forces. However, Prussian leader Frederick the Great was just maneuvering all over the place, keeping the British hopes on the continent alive. I'm not really going to go into a whole lot of detail on the Continental European War. However, I think it is important that I explain my reasons for this. First, it is a tangled mess. You have got a lot of countries, specifically France, Austria, Russia, Sweden, Hungary, amongst others on one side, facing off against the British and Prussian forces on the other. Unsurprisingly, each one of these countries is fighting for its own specific end goals, most of which will not have a large impact on our story. Second, we have spent the last 18 episodes discussing this war, and it is really time for us to move forward. While the war in Europe is interesting, and arguably the Seven Years' War could be looked at as a truly world war, I want to keep the show narrowly focused, so really the individual battles on the continent don't matter that much. What is important for the moment is knowing that the war in Europe was bogged down. Outside of Europe, however, the war was most definitely not bogging down. As I'm sure all of you are now very well aware of, the British had just scored a monumental victory in Canada under Amherst. On the other side of the globe, they would weeks later have similar success in India. There, it was an army assembled under the East India Company that allied with local Indians, and they were quickly able to force the French out. Well, the French were doing fine at home. Abroad, it was a much different story. The French Empire by this point was becoming increasingly endangered. Likewise, the French were probably also wondering what the British were planning for the future of North America. 
the French had been booted from Canada. However, that is not their only holding. The French still held a lot of land throughout the Mississippi River Valley, with key ports in Louisiana and Alabama. As they watched their empire fracture and crumble under the British assault, they had to be nervous that the British were eyeing the prospect of kicking them out of North America entirely. Therefore, here is where everybody is standing come the fall of 1760. The British had come to dominate the war internationally. They largely accomplished this through their ability to project power with the use of their navy. The British had forced the French out of both Canada and India. The French Empire was reeling and was being dismantled one piece at a time. Meanwhile, on the European continent, things were far less clear. The British naval advantage was largely mitigated when it came to continental warfare, much to the annoyance of William Pitt. So, in summary, the war globally is going pretty great for the British, while the Continental War had turned into a messy slog with far less clear results. All things considered, you would think that in October 1760, William Pitt must have been feeling pretty good about his outlook. By this time, he was aware of the victory in Canada, and while it would be a few months before he would learn about the British ejecting the French from India, he knew things were going very well on that front as well. If William Pitt was feeling good about the progress of the war that he had been so instrumental in conducting, he was about to be dealt a series of blows that would rapidly lead to his downfall. Pitt had a good relationship with George II. This is in no small part because the war under his leadership was going very well. In the middle of October 1760, though, Pitt and George II had a disagreement over Pitt's plan to seize the small island of Bellemare located right off the French coast. Pitt wanted to flex the might of the British Navy by striking at this island and putting the French coast in danger. The real aim for Pitt in taking Belle and Mer was that it would draw the French forces positioned throughout Germany back to the French coast to stop any potential British invasion. This would, in turn, loosen up the deadlock that had gripped Central Europe and hopefully bring the French to the negotiating table. Although George II initially objected to the plan, Pitt remained confident that the king would eventually come around. The problem, however, is that on October 25th, George II would get out of bed, have a mug of hot chocolate, go to the bathroom, and then promptly die of a massive heart attack. In his place rose his grandson, George III. And oh boy, are we going to spend a lot of time on this podcast? discussing George III. Born on June 4th, 1738, George William Frederick, the future George III, was the son of Frederick, Prince of Wales, and Princess Augusta of Saxe-Gotha. By all accounts, George III had something of a lonely childhood, growing up largely isolated from other children his age. George's only real friend during his childhood was his younger brother Edward. Making this more complicated was the fact that his parents did seem to prefer his brother over him. The relationships between the men in the royal family was difficult at best. George III's father, Frederick, had a tense relationship with his own father, George II. Indeed, Frederick often stood opposed to his father, and was basically sitting around with his followers, just waiting for the old king to die. This relationship between Frederick and George II did little to get the king at all interested in his grandchildren, something that is going to come back to be an important detail. In 1751, Frederick was surrounded by followers who had often found themselves in the position of having fallen out of power under King George II. However, wishes they might that George II would die and they would ride the coattails of Frederick back into a position of influence, their dreams were promptly dashed when Frederick died in 1751. With the death of his father, George III became the heir apparent. Despite this, however, George II really never seems to have taken much of an interest in the teen. Part of this is largely due to his mother, who deeply distrusted George II and wanted to do everything she could to keep her son away from his grandfather and his influence. The result of this is that George became even more isolated than he was before with his mother firmly in control of his access to other people, 
as well as his education, she was able to exert a great deal of influence over the future monarch. This influence was felt through her introduction of George to John Stuart, the Earl of Bute. Despite being several decades his senior, Bute and the future George III quickly became friends, as Bute would act both in a role as his friend as well as tutoring the young man. As the historian Robert Middlecuff puts it, in Bute's unpracticed tans, the prince's insecure, rather rigid personality grew more rigid and no more confident. Though he became proud and intolerant of those whose views did not agree with his or his tutors. By the time that George III would take the crown, he was lacking in several of the qualities one would hope to see in a monarch. Chiefly, he often failed to show the good judgment that a monarch requires. For the first several years of his reign, it was Bute whom George III would rely upon, much to the chagrin and frustrations of his more qualified advisors. George III was critically not his grandfather. George II had taken his position as the King of Hanover very seriously, whereas George III, who had grown up in Britain and had indeed never even been to Hanover, really could not care less about it. For him, his interests were exclusively positioned on his subjects in Britain proper. What this pragmatically means is that George III and George II were radically different people. For men whose orbit therefore revolved around the now deceased king, literally overnight they found themselves swimming in uncharted and often shark-infested waters. Among those who suddenly found themselves in great political danger was none other than William Pitt himself. However, a shaky relationship with the new king aside, it was going to take a little more than that to yank Pitt down from his high perch. To accomplish this feat, it is going to take some outside influence that gives George III the opportunity to strike out against Pitt. It is right here that we really get a good idea of just how much of a pawn William Pitt was in the greater game of European politics. Because the fatal blow to his time in power would not come from some lost battle or distrust at court. Rather, it would come from the Spanish. All of this was going on when Britain was becoming more and more interested in peace. The war was wildly expensive. The Duke of Newcastle was busy trying to figure out ways to keep paying the bills and to keep the war moving along. But that was starting to become increasingly difficult to maintain. Pitt's entire system of winning at any cost really did place an emphasis on that cost part. And the cost of winning was actual money. Newcastle and indeed the Crown had become tired of seeing just how far British credit could be stretched. For his part, Pitt seemed to be either unaware or unconcerned about the changing political tides. In March 1761, Louis XV did in fact open up peace negotiations. For Newcastle, Butte, and therefore George III, this was a welcome development. Meanwhile, Pitt hardly missed a beat with his plans following George II's demise. Although there was progress being made towards the conclusion of the war, Pitt went right ahead and seized Bel and Mare with little trouble. This, as anticipated, exposed the French coast, making them, at least in theory, that much more anxious for the war to conclude. It is right around this time that the Spanish also start to become nervous that the French are going to sell them out during the negotiations. Back in episode 3.30, we had talked about the fact that the Spanish had decided that they would not play along and join the French in the war. This was, at the time, a pretty serious blow to the French. However, by the time we reached 1761, the situation had changed. The Spanish were suddenly feeling that their empire was vulnerable. The Spanish therefore decided that this would be a good time to reach out to their old friends, the French, and make sure that all was well, and that in a treaty Spanish interests would be protected. The agreement which they reached has become known as the Family Pact, since both the French and Spanish monarchs were different branches of the Bourbon line. This alone probably would not have been that much of a game-changer, except for one small wrinkle. 
the French were already not in love with the peace that the British were offering. And there was one more detail of the family pact. You see, one of the provisions of the family pact, and one that neither the French nor the Spanish shared with the other European powers, was the agreement that, if for any reason the war had not wrapped up before May 1st, 1762, the Spanish would enter as a French ally. For the French, meaningful peace negotiations really ended right there. They were not happy with the proposed peace, and now their main goal was to hold out long enough that the Spanish would be bound to join the fight. The family pact was pretty well known amongst the European powers. However, both Spain and France would have preferred to keep that part about Spain joining the war a secret. The Spanish were hoping that the family pact alone would put enough pressure on the British that it would help settle the remaining issues and get a peace hammered out. With the rift between the Spanish and the French mended, the French would be more mindful of Spanish interests, and Spain would get to have a say in the final settlement. However, in September 1761, the British learned of the Spanish plan to join the war. William Pitt immediately demanded that George III declare war on Spain, which George III promptly responded to by not declaring war on Spain. The problem is that the ministers inside of London were tired of war. They were tired of paying for it. They were tired of the resources that it took to keep it going. They wanted it over. More and more, they viewed William Pitt's demands for war as being a personal mission of conquest, rather than a valid military expenditure. When on October 3rd it became clear that the king was not going to declare war on Spain, Pitt tendered his resignation. Despite all the successes that Pitt had since taking over the war effort, there would be no begging for him to come back. The king already didn't like nor trust William Pitt. George III, therefore, was more than happy to listen to his longtime confidant in Butte, accept the resignation of Pitt, and move on without him. And this is exactly what happened. Just like that, Pitt's time in power was at an end. Though his official replacement was the Earl of Egremont, his position of influence largely fell to his brother-in-law, Lord Grenville. William Pitt might have been gone, but that did not change the situation that the Spanish did in fact have a pact to join the war if there was no peace before May 1762. Meaning that from the time Pitt resigned, the clock was ticking and only seven months were left. In late October, the British informed the Spanish that the time had come to declare their intentions when it came to Britain. Spanish leadership back in Madrid pretended not to get the message. The British, becoming increasingly annoyed, tried again on November 19th, demanding that the Spanish declare their intentions, this time clarifying that anything other than an unequivocal pronouncement of peaceful intentions towards Britain would be taken as a declaration of war. Once again, the Spanish failed to respond, and on January 4th, 1762, Britain responded by declaring war on Spain. This was not a good thing for Spain or their monarch, Charles III. Despite their agreement to join the war, they did not actually want to, you know, join the war. At most, they had just hoped that the family pact would give them a chance to slide in at the last minute and have their voice, via their relationship with France, in the eventual peace outcome. The Spanish did not actually want war with a fully mobilized British military. Spain was in decline by this point and had been for a while. If they had renewed the family pact to preserve their empire, which was still considerable in terms of actual area, getting into a war with Great Britain was about the worst possible outcome. Yet, the British had declared war, so the Spanish were stuck. What the British envisioned in their conflict with Spain was two primary objectives. In the West, the target was going to be Havana. In the east, it was Manila. Turning first towards Havana, even before his downfall, Pitt had ordered Amherst to take the French island of Martinique. At this junction, the plan was to attack French holdings throughout the Caribbean, which is exactly what occurred. 
Amherst gave the mission to Robert Monckton, who we last saw being shot in the chest during the Battle of Quebec. Suffice it to say, he had recovered nicely. The British took with them some 7,000 troops from North America and met up with another army of 7,000 from the West Indies. The outcome of the battle was never in question, and on February 16, 1762, the island fell into British hands. Quickly, the rest of the French holdings in the Caribbean followed suit, as yet more of the French Empire eroded away. Critically, the war had been rough on those living on the islands, who were more than happy to see the arrival of the British and a reopening of trade. Pragmatically, this means that you do not have a local populace fighting for the French to remain in control. They simply wanted things to be better than how they had been, regardless of if their overlords are French or British. This is similar to the response that we saw throughout Canada, when the civilian population was just happy to see an end of the war in sight and begin a much-needed economic recovery. However, with the Spanish now in the war, their holdings in the Caribbean became just as exposed as those French colonies. Sure enough, the British absolutely dominated the Caribbean throughout all of 1762, leading to the eventual capitulation of Spanish-held Havana. Now, again, I'm not going to go into details about battles during this episode, and more so, my goal is really just to give a quick background of how the rest of the war went. However, when it comes to Havana, there are some important things that we have got to know. Havana was a huge deal both for the victorious British and the defeated Spanish. If you had any doubt about who the world's predominant naval power was, there should be no question. It has been over 100 episodes since we discussed the Battle of the Spanish Armada. However, the British had clearly eclipsed the Spanish on the seas by the time of the Seven Years' War. This became even more obvious when the British managed to block the port of Havana, trapping a quarter of the Spanish fleet inside on June the 7th. The siege would last until August 14th, at which point the Spanish were forced to surrender. The Battle of Havana would prove to be both extraordinarily expensive and profitable all at once. On the expense side of the ledger is the fact that the British gave up a tremendous amount of men in order to capture the island. Though the Spanish did inflict some damage on the British troops, the real killer was not enemy bullets, but tropical disease. It is estimated that of the regulars who fought and later occupied Cuba, at least half would die, with the vast majority of those deaths coming from disease. On the other side, however, Havana was easily the most critical port for the Spanish in the region. Its loss was devastating for the Spanish and their ability to project power throughout the Caribbean. This is to say nothing for the actual material wealth held inside of the city, which was now available for the British to take. On the other side of the globe, the British were having equal amounts of success in the Philippines, where they managed to capture Manila and force the surrender of over 9,000 Spanish troops. Although, as huge of a victory as this was, it is worth mentioning that it played little role in the end of the war. This is because information travels slowly, Manila is a really long ways away from Europe, and by the time that information arrived, the war was over. The British occupation of Manila was rough, too. Unlike in Canada and the Caribbean, the local population was not thrilled to see the British, nor the resumption of their trade. They did not want the British there, and never balked at the chance to violently resist. By the end of 1762, everybody was super tired of war. The French and the Spanish were reeling and had both taken extensive blows to their empires. Back on the continent, the war had become an expensive stalemate for all parties. Well, the French were faring much better in Europe. The war had become extremely expensive to maintain. Furthermore, no matter how much the British kept subsidizing their Hanoverian allies, it simply was no longer enough money to cover the costs. The British, in certain aspects, had the most difficult time with the peace deal. There were definitely those looking at the situation and saying, hey, we're winning like crazy. Why would we want to quit with all this winning right now? This, however, is the exact situation that both George III and Butte wanted to avoid. George III understood 
that a harsh peace and an overextended British Empire would make for a fragile peace. Indeed, although the British had just won the single largest war in their history, in dramatic fashion, the Peace of Paris, which was signed on November 3, 1762, was surprisingly lenient in its terms. With the peace, the British acquired Canada and control of North America out to the Mississippi River, though New Orleans would switch hands from a French to a Spanish port. The British would return Havana to Spain, though in exchange they gained Florida. The French recovered most, but not all, of their islands in the Caribbean. On the continent, things returned to, more or less, a state of status quo antebellum. Politically, the peace would cost Butte his job, as there were plenty of loud voices complaining that the British had not won enough. This opposition was largely from the former followers of William Pitt. Among the things that had made Butte so unpopular was he moved to add a four-shilling tax on the production of cider. This tax proved to be wildly unpopular, leading to riots in regions that were dependent on the production of cider and would help spell the end for Butte though his tax did survive his ousting. Replacing Butte was Lord Grenville, who really has spent today's episode just moving on up in the world. Just as a final bit of foreshadowing, I recommend that you keep the cider tax in the back of your mind. It is going to be coming up again here in the future. The Seven Years' War was now over. The war was, in all senses, a truly global conflict, and had seen the European powers fighting across the entire earth. We have been discussing the French and Indian War for months now. It has taken me 18 episodes to, I hope, explain the events in North America. For the British, despite some complaints at home, it had been an astonishing victory. They had acquired huge swaths of land and had greatly increased the size of the empire. The British had clearly established themselves as the predominant global power. The war, however, had left other long-lasting consequences. Yes, the British had won, and in fact, they had done so convincingly. However, the war and the subsequent peace agreement had stretched the empire thin. Britain had left the war holding more territory than they had ever held before. The British military could convey power unlike ever before. However, what Britain was also left with was a crushing level of debt that was going to need to be paid back. Even before the war had begun, leaders in London were becoming concerned with the rising national debt. William Pitt, through the course of the war, would help to more than double that debt. What the British were then left with at the end of the war was a vastly increased empire built on the back of a vastly increased amount of debt. As we are going to see next season, the ramifications for the French and Indian War are going to be felt almost immediately. So many of the tribes that had allied with the British during the Eastern Conferences felt not just forgotten, but felt as though they had been played by the British. Therefore, despite the end of the French and Indian War, peace would not proliferate throughout North America, but rather a new series of conflicts would rise up in its place. When we pick back up with the narrative, it is going to be by exploring these conflicts. What can we say about the French and Indian War that we have not already said? I do not plan to dive into a long epilogue here discussing the legacy of the war, largely because the legacy of the war is so significant as we move forward. We are going to see that many of the roots of the coming imperial crisis are going to trace directly back to the French and Indian War. In that fashion, much of the epilogue to the French and Indian War is going to be fleshed out during our season 4 narrative. Critically, however, This group of people entering the world stage right now are not simply American Revolution adjacent. These are the men that are going to fight the war, on both sides. During the course of this series, we were introduced to George Washington, William Howe, Thomas Gage, Israel Putnam, and George III, just to name a few. And really, these are just a few. So many people we are going to discuss during the Revolution are people who would first cut their teeth during the French and Indian War. It is important not to lose sight of just how close our colonists are to the revolution at this point. 
The end of the Seven Years' War comes just 12 years before the Battle of Lexington and Concord, 13 years from the Declaration of Independence. For those who are going to come to define the Revolution, they are going to come up in a world where the French and Indian War had very much helped to define their worldviews. At the end of the war, John Adams was 28, Thomas Jefferson was 20, John Jay 18, and James Madison 12. Even for Madison, who was just 12 years old at the time, the French and Indian War would help define the politics that existed in the colonies as he grew into adulthood. We are no longer talking about the grandparents of the revolutionary generation. Though many of them are still young, we are talking about the people who will ultimately help create the United States. As central as the French and Indian War is going to be to the coming revolution, I want to make sure that I'm not overstating this. While the French and Indian War is going to be critical, the revolution is certainly not inevitable in 1763. There are still numerous points where the war could have been avoided. The role of the French and Indian War in the years after 1763 is going to be in exposing problems in the existing relationship. Before we can do that, we have our standard two-episode season in review, a retrospective episode that is going to look back over the entire colonial era, and then finally our Q&A episode. So again, if you have questions about anything, please go ahead and send those along to me. I'll put the info in the show notes for this week. After that, we move to season four, which will take us from the end of the French and Indian War to the end of the American Revolution. Next time, when we return, we are going to jump into the first part of our season in review. Until then, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you back here next time as we look back and review the major events that we talked about this season. <laughs>